the first thing that one has to take into account uh, when asking where the emigres uh, came from and what they brought with them uh, is uh, to look at the Weimar Republic itself. I mean, this is uh, the, uh, in a way, central uh, reality out of which they emerged. And Weimar was an enormously rich uh, and complicated uh, intellectual landscape with a great deal of innovation, uh, both within the universities and outside it. And many of the intellectuals uh, and scholars and artists were people who were making their way in a world that uh, was uh, very new, uh, the Wilhelmian world before World War I was very different. And many of them were coming to grips with uh, the modernity that they saw around them in the great cities like Berlin and Frankfurt uh, and Hamburg and Munich. Uh, there were people who were trying to, in a way, invent a new role for themselves. And uh, Jews were, of course, enormously important for the first time in German life. Uh, with a great deal of obstacles to face, but nonetheless with uh, extraordinary success stories until obviously uh, everything was cut short in 1933. So to do justice to the migration is to think about the links between uh, Weimar and what came afterwards. I mean, I'm now excluding uh, non-German uh, emigres in Austria and elsewhere, but let's uh, just focus on the German case. So what this involved, among other things, uh, was an awareness of the new media, of the new mass media, of uh, the architectural changes that were occurring, of the new urban landscape, all the things that made Germany in the 1920s uh, a cutting edge uh, of modernity. Whether one liked it or not, this was a challenge for a lot of these intellectuals. And so they brought to the United States, in an interesting way, a certain anticipation of uh, things that they found in America, uh, why? Because uh, modernization, modernity in Weimar was itself often understood to have uh, an American accent. Uh, the autobiography of Henry Ford, for example, was a bestseller, and boxing, uh, boxers from the United States were uh, heroes as well as Germany, and films that came from Hollywood were important, uh, even though the German cinema was quite extraordinary. So that uh, there was a fascination with America during the 1920s, and a lot of the intellectuals uh, who came to the United States had themselves already encountered a version of things American. Now, having said that, many of them were also, of course, steeped in traditional uh, notions of German uh, Bildung, or self-formation, which stressed the importance uh, of high culture, of philosophy, mostly idealist philosophy. Uh, they were very much uh, cosmopolitan intellectuals who understood the importance of the humanist tradition, broadly understood. And this too they brought with them, although sometimes with a critical edge. So the first thing to think about when we understand the migration is that they were bringing with them uh, a very vibrant uh, Vermin, uh, German culture which needed itself uh, to be sorted out, both politically and uh, in a way philosophically, uh, in terms of the values that they uh, upheld. And as a result, uh, there's no single story to be told. There were people from the right and from the left. There were people who were empiricists. There were people who were theoreticians. There were people who uh, were German idealists. There were people who were interested in psychoanalysis. Uh, there were people who were interested in modern architecture. One thinks of the Bauhaus, great uh, pioneers of modern ar architecture, and so forth. So that this was a very, very mixed uh, story. And as a result, uh, the pattern is a very, very complex one. And the United States benefited to a great extent, I would argue, from precisely that complexity, which they brought with them an experimental as well as uh, what we might call traditional attitude towards learning and towards intellectual life. Uh, and many of them, when they came to a place like Berkeley, represented more than just the narrow academy. They represented that larger world uh, out of which they had come, a world that was politically richer, that was more uh, intellectually expansive, a world that was more experimental. Uh, the process of coming to the United States was a very uneven one as well because many of them were reluctant to leave Europe. Uh, many of them went initially to places like Prague or Paris or even uh, the Riviera, saint elie sur mer They thought that their exile would be temporary. They maintained links back home. They were not anxious to go uh, across the Atlantic to learn a new language and to fend for themselves in a world that was very foreign. So there was no immediate rush uh, in 1933. And in fact, uh, the United States was also, from the other end, uh, not uh, extraordinarily uh, welcoming. Uh, there were quotas. Uh, you had to have an affidavit showing you could make a living. Uh, Anti-Semitism sometimes um, could be a, a tacit or maybe explicit problem. And of course, one has to remember this was during the Depression. 
Uh, and as a result, jobs were uh, few and far between. And so uh, emigres coming were taking uh, American jobs. And so there was a kind of, we might say, um, spotty reception uh, with emigres not always ending up at the great institutions uh, that we now identify with the emigration, uh, Princeton's Institute for Advanced Study or Sh University of Chicago or uh, the New School under Alvin Johnson or Berkeley. Uh, many of them ended up uh, in jobs that were not commensurate with their background. Uh, to a certain extent, this was an advantage for the places where they went. And one of the great examples of this uh, is the role they played in the historical black uh, colleges in the South. A number of emigres went uh, to places uh, like uh, Tuskegee and Tougaloo and were very important uh, in uh, the faculties there for many years. So the emigres uh, were uh, in some cases lucky, in many cases had to struggle there. English was not so good. The work they had done in German was not taken very seriously by people who couldn't read German. Uh, by the time our story begins, as it were, the story that I can tell from personal experience, uh, the vicissitudes of the early emigration had long since uh, been left behind. And by then, in the 1950s and into the 60s, uh, they were figures who had become the ones who survived this process uh, fairly successful. They were figures who had basically survived and done quite well and were now in a way the leading members of the uh, let's say the professions uh, and the disciplines uh, that they had entered. Uh, so the people at Berkeley when I arrived, uh, and I first came in 1968, uh, they were already in a sense uh, nearing the end of their careers and were uh, willing to look back at a story which they were able to narrate as basically a success story. But uh, one ought not to forget all of the failures and all the half successes of many of the other emigres who struggled, some of whom went back uh, after 1945. Not many, I think 17% of the German emigres uh, who came to the United States went back either to East or to West Germany, uh, leaving most of them behind. They'd been here for a decade or so and established themselves, but some were not happy. There are famous cases like Brecht and Thomas Mann uh, who were upset with American politics and went back to Europe. But the ones who stayed, the ones who made careers, were by and large uh, the sort of successful survivors. And uh, they were able to look back when I arrived on the scene with a kind of uh, you know, glow of uh, gratitude for the American uh, welcome that they uh, received. And institutions like Berkeley benefited enormously from that. We can step back uh, chronologically and look at what happened after January, I mean, of course, also before, but especially after January and April of 1933 and uh, essentially expulsions or forced retirements and, you know, and the whole sort of being outcast within Germany, within Europe. Uh, if we could look at that, that'd be great. And also the strategies to arrive to the United States. You, you touched upon it a little mm. bit, but... Of course, there are many different ways. You, you mentioned affidavits and, and so on. We have some of those documents in the exhibition, so that. But um, if you can sort of go over that trajectory. Well, there was always a, a difficulty in terms of the moment in a person's career and getting a new job. So that people near the end of their careers, uh, people who had established themselves, if they were not famous, uh, had a lot of trouble. They were, in a way, too far along. They were perhaps uh, no longer uh, considered to be um, good risks for future uh, careers. Uh, the other end of the spectrum, people who were too young had not yet established themselves. They had perhaps to get a new uh, credential in the United States. So the people in the middle, the people who had made some international connections, the people whose reputations were growing, the people who uh, were energetic, uh, had a, a better chance. Uh, they needed, however, connections. They needed uh, someone who would vouch for them, someone who would be able to uh, ease the way, uh, both in monetary terms and perhaps to get the difficult affidavit that you had to have the person could survive. So there's no one pattern, uh, and some people went from job to job. The most infamous case, perhaps, is that of the philosopher Ernst Bloch, uh, who, uh, and this may be apocryphal, but I think it's true, had to uh, uh, wash dishes in Cambridge, Massachusetts for many years because he couldn't uh, get uh, a decent academic job. Finally went back first to East Germany and then 1961 uh, went to the West ending up in Tübingen. So there were some stories that were not so successful and of course there are other emigres uh, 
who went to other parts of the world, uh, like Stefan Zweig, who uh, committed suicide, Ernst Toller. I mean, it's a story uh, that is not uniformly uh, a positive one. But once they did get established, uh, the people who had you know, the qualities that made them successful in Germany and who were able to master English did quite well. Uh, it's often said that writers, people who had been creative writers, had most difficulty in the United States because they couldn't write in German anymore. The audience pretty much dried up and they couldn't really yet write in English. So they were pretty much, uh, you know, in, in real trouble. Musicians had a possibility, uh, composers, for example, in Hollywood, they wrote often for the movies, sometimes despising the compromises they made. Artists occasionally could do well when thinks of Hans Hoffmann, who had a Berkeley connection. Uh, and intellectuals, it depended really on the fit between what they were doing uh, and uh, the fields as they existed in the United States. So an excellent example of that kind of fit doesn't occur at Berkeley, but uh, at Columbia with Paul Lazarsfeld, who was from Austria originally, was a quantitative social scientist, and created one of the first market research uh, organizations, uh, the Institute for Applied uh, Social Research, I think it was called, at Columbia, and became uh, involved with uh, radio and other uh, media and was very influential in uh, the marriage of the academy and the advertising industry and uh, all types of poll taking. And he did a kind of quantitative social research that fit pretty well with American uh, traditions. Um, so there was a kind of, I would say, commensurability. But other intellectuals who had a very different uh, training um, struggled to establish themselves. Uh, so as I said earlier, it's a very uneven process. Uh, historians, uh, if they brought a certain expertise in, say, European history, Central European history in particular, one thinks, say, of Hayo Holborn at Yale or Hans Rosenberg at uh, Berkeley, uh, these were people who had a significant uh, impact in the profession and trained many people at the great elite institutions, political science, people like Franz Neumann after a while at Columbia and so forth. So, uh, you know, by the 40s, 50s into the 60s, they were making their mark. Uh, but it was a long time uh, in between their arrival and that success. Some of them, during the war, in fact, um, found employment in the government. And one ought not to forget the roles that many of them played in the OSS, so the OWI, the Office uh, of uh, War Information, uh, working in a way with propaganda uh, for the Allies, working sometimes uh, as translators during the Nuremberg trials. A certain uh, group of them went over, some were GIs. Uh, Klaus Mann, for example, the son of Thomas Mann, I think was a GI. So that there were a number of different roles that they could play before they finally settled uh, in a uh, you know, time that was a bit easier uh, into the academic life that we now remember most of them for following. A few words on the rapture of 1933. You mentioned some thought that this would wither away and right. pass soon, fast, others not. We, we have in the exhibition, we have these letters from Einstein Albert uh -huh. to Einstein Alfred, 1933, where he says, you know, America would be a good place for you. And uh, Europe is, you know, forget about Europe, basically, which is, it's very interesting in so many words, basically, that's what, what, that's what he says. Uh, but at that time, the Alfred Einstein was in Italy and probably hoping that he could just stay there and, and wait for the storm to pass. Um, however, most of these individuals experienced directly uh, being pushed out of their homeland, of their intellectual, linguistic world, etc. If you can address that, uh, that experience. Well, many of them were uh, fired. They were fired for either political or uh, ethnic, can, we can might I call it. Can I ask you to, to frame it from the beginning? So, right. some, like, you know, you could say, you could start from right. uh, 1933 or the rise of uh, what, what, right. whichever way, but give, it a, give us a, a, like a historical moment to... The most dramatic uh, expression of the, um, we might say, necessity of emigration was the burning of the books uh, in May of uh, 1933, uh, in which uh, the Nazis decided to create bonfires of books they disliked in many different cities. Uh, and of course, among them were books by, uh, by uh, future emigres, uh, Jewish, uh, sometimes politically dubious books, sometimes books that uh, the Nazis for one reason or another found objectionable. And uh, as um, Leo Lowenthal once said, um, I think he was quoting Heine, but uh, it was very opposite. Uh, you know, you begin by burning books and soon you begin burning people. 
Uh, and so this was seen as a very ominous uh, sign. And many of the refugees, uh, future refugees, saw the handwriting on the wall and sought to find uh, exits. Now, uh, as we said earlier, not everybody welcomed them. And so there were quotas, there were <coughs> obstacles uh, produced by uh, countries that were uh, not interested in bringing new intellectuals in. I mean, for example, Canada has a particularly deplorable history of mostly, uh, you know, uh, accepting people who had agricultural backgrounds but not uh, intellectuals. There was a certain amount of anti-Semitism in French Quebec. Uh, uh, the history in Switzerland is terrible. There were some places, of course, that did quite well. Uh, Shanghai was a center for many uh, refugees, and there were some parts of uh, Latin America uh, that did uh, reasonably well. The um, uh, Dominican Republic, uh, there were people who went to places like uh, Peru and Bolivia and uh, you know, places you would never imagine they would be welcomed. And so Jews uh, and emigres, political and otherwise, uh, often had to uh, go where they could uh, you know, find refuge. Turkey, another obvious place, Istanbul. So uh, the United States was, um, I would say, uh, on this spectrum, reasonably welcoming, but not obviously as welcoming as it might have been towards refugees, uh, intellectuals uh, in particular, but in, in general. And so it was always uh, a, um, you know, a very, uh, I think, real struggle for them uh, to get out. But without employment and uh, with various rules uh, that were beginning to restrict their freedom in, uh, in Germany, many of them decided they would have to leave. Although, of course, there was, and this is something that historians now recognize, a kind of, let's call it quasi-honeymoon for German Jews in the middle 30s, during the period, for example, the Olympic Games. Uh, and then it was not until Kristallnacht in 1938 that the full weight of Nazi uh, intentions were made apparent. And so for a while, um, there were many German Jews who decided to weather the storm. And this is something that uh, is not utterly irrational. Jews, after all, had been uh, able to duck down and survive pogroms in Europe for many years. And the hope was that this too would pass. And no one, of course, in the mid-30s had any inkling of how awful uh, the future would become. Uh, most of the Jews of Germany um, were able to find a way out, at least in the comparison with the Jews who were trapped uh, in Poland and uh, Western Russia and other parts of Eastern Europe. And of course the Holocaust, as we know, killed far, far many Jews from the territories taken by the Nazis after 1939 than uh, in Germany itself. But that's getting a bit, I guess, ahead of ourselves. Uh, those refugees also, if they had the good fortune to get out, some of them came uh, to the United States, but many of them had uh, far fewer options than the German Jews who had six or eight years at least to uh, try to get out, and uh, in some cases uh, with uh, the success that we now celebrate. Um, so there are a couple more questions I, I want to ask you. One is um, in the process of intellectual migration to America. Um, do you see um, patterns of intellectual continuity? I'm, I'm asking the as, like right. a question of intellectual history. Patterns of continuity and or patterns of reframing. And so thinking about a, a modified audience and then zeroing specifically on, on Berkeley, on the kind of audience that some of these intellectuals Right. found in, in Berkeley? Well, my sense is that there's always been um, a certain, let's say, elective affinity between those uh, intellectuals in Weimar who were the modernizers, who accepted a certain notion of modernity and uh, valorized it, uh, between them and the positive reception in America. I mean, Ronheim Bendix was a great student of Max Weber, and Weber was understood, rightly or wrongly, as the anti-Marxist celebrant of rational legal authority in the modern world. And uh, this was something that the United States could uh, connect with. Uh, people who were further to the left or people further to the right had, I think, more difficulty. People who were nostalgic for a pre-modern world or people who had, let's say, a socialist or maybe anarchist critique of uh, capitalist modernity. So to take the former first, Berkeley had for a while an extraordinarily important uh, medieval star in Ernst Kantorovich, who uh, was a member of the Stefan Georgi circle in the Weimar Republic, a right-wing, uh, hero-worshipping, very, very elitist, very uh, nostalgic, uh, anti-democratic, uh, political, uh, aesthetic circle. He wrote an extraordinarily important book on the King's Two Bodies, came to Berkeley and had uh, 
you know, beginning of an important career here, but then in a quite interesting uh, gesture, refused to uh, accept the loyalty oath and resigned and was then able to pick up and have a great career at Princeton for many years afterwards. He resigned, interestingly, not because he was a left-wing uh, critic of McCarthyism and who had perhaps communist links that he didn't want to disclose, but rather because he understood the university as a corporate structure, structure, something that was like a medieval corporation, and disliked the intrusion of the modern state, disliked the intrusion of the intrusive uh, you know, loyalty oath that you had to somehow sign, uh, not to uh, the ideals of the university, but rather the ideals uh, of uh, loyalty to a particular state. And so he left us. Uh, most other uh, conservative thinkers, I think, um, had a little more trouble in the United States. I mean, some ended up teaching Clemens von Klemper, for example, who wrote a book on Germany's new conservatism, uh, taught in Massachusetts, I think at Smith, um, maybe Holyoke, I forget which. And there were others who had similar possible, uh, let's say, uh, careers, but most of the time I think they struggled. Uh, there was some, you know, I, I guess uh, Eric Fogelin, who a uh, philosopher, made a career in, uh, I think, Louisiana State. But uh, the people to the left also sometimes had difficulty. I mentioned the Ernst Bloch story. Herbert Marcuse is an interesting example. He uh, taught after being at the Russian Research Center at uh, Columbia at Brandeis for a number of years. But in the 1960s, mid-60s, was basically forced out by Abraham Sacher the relatively conservative uh, president of Brandeis University. Uh, only recently, interestingly, Brandeis has decided to issue a formal apology for the ways in which he was uh, forced out, and I can go into some detail uh, about that. He then found, uh, in a way, a second refuge here in California, in San Diego, although had some difficulty during the 60s because of his support for the student movement and was harassed uh, by right-wing uh, non-university people uh, in San Diego. So the people who succeeded most, I would say, were the people who were in tune with American, uh, let's say, self, uh, self-understanding of America as the uh, quintessential vanguard of modernity. Uh, the same thing with the international style, the architecture uh, that we associate with the Bauhaus. Uh, people like Gropius uh, and Mies van der Rohe came to uh, you know, various places, uh, Harvard, uh, uh, Illinois Institute of Technology, and taught uh, the new generation of architects who created the uh, great uh, glass and steel skyscrapers of uh, Manhattan and uh, elsewhere during the 1950s and 60s. And that was very much part of the American uh, absorption, we might say, of a certain Weimar uh, aesthetic. So broadly speaking, I would say they were the ones who prospered. I mentioned Paul Azersfeld, whose uh, type of uh, social scientific quantitative research also fit well with a certain positivist ethos uh, in the United States. Uh, so broadly speaking, these were, I think, the more, let's say, um, obvious fits. But there were, of course, outliers. I mean, Hannah Arendt would be a very interesting case of a figure who defies easy categorization uh, and ultimately, of course, made an extraordinarily uh, important career in the United States, although not without obvious controversy. So there were some figures who transcended that kind of, uh, let's say, uh, fit. Um, but by and large, I think it was made easier if you, you uh, were in that mold. Arrival of immigrant intellectuals to Berkeley, and if there is one figure in particular that you feel should be highlighted. Well, the one figure I was most closely associated with uh, was Leo Lowenthal, who uh, I first met in 1968. Uh, before I joined the faculty, I came here to do research on my dissertation, which was on the Frankfurt School, the Institute of Social Research, uh, which had moved from Germany in 33, 34, first to Geneva briefly, and then to New York. Uh, and then ultimately, many of its members went back. But Leo was a uh, a member of the school from the mid-twenties on. It was a major figure in its history. And so I came to work on his papers, and it was an enormously, um, you know, uh, stroke of great luck that he was very, very uh, open and willing to help me with uh, that uh, project and open his archive and answer questions. And then, uh, without uh, expecting it, three years later, I was invited to join the history department. So we it grew uh, you know, into, uh, uh, into close friends, and I, uh, you know, edited his autobiography in English, uh, which is called An Unmastered Past, and uh, organized a conference ten years after his death. Uh, 
Leolantho was in many ways an exemplary emigre. Uh, he had a background in philosophy and sociology, was very interested uh, in literature, had an extraordinary uh, background in uh, a kind of, uh, in a way, uh, empirical work. Uh, he was not simply theoretician. Uh, he had uh, a wide variety of political interests. He was close to uh, many of the important intellectuals of the Weimar era, even as a young man, and so was uh, a kind of living uh, residue, we might say, trace of uh, Weimar. Uh, but in addition to that, and this is what made him, I think, uh, important for many of my generation, he was a link not with the past, or not with it alone, but also with the potential future. That is to say, the emigres represented, in some respects, an alternative uh, to uh, the status quo. And uh, Leo Lowenthal and his uh, fellow members of the Frankfurt School were uh, anxious to criticize the present in the name of a possible future. And so they were, to some extent, inspirational, uh, certainly in Germany and the United States, uh, with Herbert Marcuse in particular, uh, on the New Left. Uh, Lowenthal, however, was a very realistic, sober, shrewd, and uh, in some ways, um, very moderate figure. Uh, he was both radical and, uh, and utopian in certain beliefs, but moderate in his behavior. So he was a mixture, we might say, of a kind of idealism uh, and also uh, a practical, straightforward realism, uh, slightly even cynical side, which I have to say I admired in addition to the idealism. And he was a figure who transcended disciplinary boundaries. So like many of the emigres, he couldn't be put in a pigeonhole. He came first in our rhetoric department and then joined sociology, but was very much involved in all the uh, literatures, especially German and English. Uh, he wrote about uh, literary figures in the past in a number of his books. He was also involved uh, to a great extent in the history department uh, with many uh, mutual friends, uh, Tom LeCur and myself, uh, perhaps uh, the most obvious, but Reggie Zelnick. There are many, many good friends of Leo uh, who were in the history department. So he was a figure who transcended boundaries. And he also transcended generations. Uh, he was able somehow to create a circle of younger friends, Stephen Greenblatt, Howard Block, uh, Michael Andre Bernstein, uh, a number of people, uh, Vicky Bennell, uh, who were 30, 40 years uh, his junior, and yet Leo was able to speak to us um, in ways that incorporated us into his world uh, and also uh, allowed him to join ours. He was uh, extraordinarily interested in the university, he was on the budget committee, he was very fascinated by uh, gossip. Uh, he could uh, never get his fill of uh, the kind of inside stories about the institution well into his 80s. So he was, uh, you know, very, very, in this sense, unusual, uh, but nonetheless, I would say, exemplary figure who brought alive uh, to many of us what had been, uh, you know, the living uh, and most vibrant uh, dimensions of uh, Weimar and uh, the hopes, uh, the future orientation, we might say, uh, of the past. Do you think that um, these people's uh, first-hand experience of totalitarianism got translated into the ethos of Berkeley? As refugees from Nazism, uh, in particular, and broadly speaking, totalitarianism, their antennae were always up for potential indications of uh, a repeat in the United States. So during the McCarthy period, a number of them were uh, heroic enough to resist. I mentioned earlier Ernst Kantorovich resisting from uh, the right. There were others who were also not happy with that. Some even left the United States. Uh, and during the 1960s, this is an interesting uh, dimension of their uh, involvement. Uh, although inspirational, that is to say some of their earlier writings in particular were picked up by the students, they also were wary of what they saw as the demagogic and irrational and even anti-democratic elitism that they uh, feared uh, was uh, potentially there in the student movement. So a number of them, uh, for example, Henry Pachter, um, uh, the, you know, I guess to some extent Ron Harbendix, became very suspicious uh, of the new left. Uh, Lowenthal, in his autobiography, uh, I, uh, which is called Mitmachen wollte ich nie in German and an unmastered past in English, talks of 1966 as a turning point. He was in favor of the students during the free speech movement, but by 66 he began to become increasingly wary. And although he had participated in the Muscatine Report, which talked about uh, the uh, necessary changes in higher education, 
he began in a way to uh, maintain a certain uh, distance from the more radical uh, and uh, in some ways more anti-democratic elements in the student movement, uh, self-righteous and willing occasionally even to use violence, something that happened in Germany uh, as well. Here, although he never broke publicly with Herbert Marcuse, I think he shared with uh, Theodor Adorno and others uh, like Max Horkheimer back in Germany a certain uh, unwillingness to go as far as the students uh, were, uh, at least some of them, hopeful of going. Uh, understood by some to be a betrayal, although he was never, I think, very um, widely accused of having betrayed students. Marcuse sometimes was. Adorno certainly was. But nonetheless, uh, you know, aware of the fact that the students had good intentions. So it was a very mixed um, story, but certainly the totalitarian uh, Nazi experience meant that they were not quite as willing to give up some of the uh, procedural um, uh, legal safeguards, uh, liberal if you want to call them that, uh, uh, of the society which they learned in the United States to appreciate uh, in ways that perhaps some of the students uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, had uh, begun to uh, forget. Is there a qualitative difference between those intellectuals who came to the United States and stayed in, stayed in the United States and those who either, either stayed in Europe through various ways or who went back? Uh, the ones, the intellectuals who stayed in Europe were often called uh, uh, inner emigres, and many of them, if they weren't Jewish, were able to uh, lie fairly low. Occasionally, um, in certain moments, they were uh, besmirched by a kind of either opportunist or, alas, sometimes ideological collaboration. I mean, Heidegger, uh, maybe Ernst Jünger, Carl Schmitt, uh, even briefly figures like Hans-Georg Gadamer, who were uh, you know, among the most important intellectuals of the 20th century, Gottfried Benn, the poet, uh, were uh, in some complicated way a bit too close to the Nazis uh, and a bit too apologetic and had, after the war, under certain circumstances, to pay for this. Uh, there were other inner emigres who indeed were apolitical and perhaps were not as besmirched. Uh, when some went back, like Thomas Mann after the war, they had in fact to face the reproach that they had left their posts, that they had somehow deserted as if they should have stayed around and fought. Uh, ultimately, Thomas Mann won that battle and the people who accused him were understood to be basically pygmies who were trying to nip at the heels of giants like Thomas Mann. The ones who uh, remained in the United States some of them were so disgusted with Germany, they wouldn't go back, wouldn't even speak the language, had no interest in helping Germany after the war. Uh, others, uh, like members of the Frankfurt School or some members of the New Beginning, uh, the New Beginning as it was called, Neu Beginning, went back with the hope that they could rebuild uh, a democratic Germany. And it was a difficult uh, choice. And some of them felt good about it ultimately, others were not so happy. Some went back to East Germany. I mentioned earlier uh, Bertolt Brecht or uh, Certainly, uh, you know, someone like uh, uh, Alfred Kantorovich, not to be confused with Ernst. These are figures who went back. They had been communists or fellow travelers. Uh, Ernst Bloch had a less happy experience. Um, it was a complicated uh, choice to make. The uh, economic possibilities were not as great. Many people had made careers in the United States. Going back was a risk. Uh, Heinrich Mann, Thomas Mann's brother, was about to go back before he died, might have even been the president of uh, the German Democratic Republic. So it was, uh, you know, each case was different. Um, the ones who stayed, I think, basically felt good about their choices, and some went back uh, grudgingly, some went back, uh, you know, and they did not like what they saw. Others were encouraged by possibilities as Germany developed into the 1950s in a more stable and uh, more liberal direction than they had feared would be the case uh, after the war. I have one last question, and it's actually interesting that you brought up Thomas Mann uh, right now because uh, it was actually the first sort of question I had. I noted down when I was thinking about this, but um, I was thinking about Susan Sontag's uh, short uh, autobiographical account, Pilgrimage, mm. when she in Los Angeles as a 16, 15 year old takes a friend and they knock on, on Thomas Mann's door in the Palisades and and they eventually get invited for tea and are all excited about uh, meeting Thomas Mann, this uh, man from another planet, and yet that felt so like a cultural hero to them. So I guess my, my question is, uh, is to you. How do you relate to this uh, 
group of people, both as individuals who you've met, you've researched, you know, intimately through personal acquaintance and to through through archival research. And, um, and um, so how, how do you relate to them? Do you feel a sense of uh, reverence? That's what, uh, in a way, Sontag's account is about, right? It's this sort of otherness or, or a sense yeah. of continuity or both. How my own personal relationship began uh, when I uh, wrote my dissertation on the Frankfurt School. My dissertation advisor, H. Stuart Hughes at Harvard, had been a uh, colleague in the OSS during the Second World War with Franz Neumann, with Herbert Marcuse, he knew Otto Kirchheimer, was friendly with a number of other emigres. Uh, and so it was a connection that was in a way uh, initially intellectual, but then I had the good fortune of meeting a number of them. And I mentioned Leo Lowenthal, but I knew, uh, I met Hannah Arendt, I knew Herbert Marcuse, I knew, knew Paul Lazarsfeld, uh, I met Horkheimer, I met Adorno. Um, I met Henry Pachter. Uh, I had the good fortune of meeting them near the end of their careers. And uh, there's no question that they were figures of uh, numinous uh, importance. All had a kind of aura of depth and seriousness uh, and polish that was very difficult uh, to ignore. And I felt very fortunate that I met those that I uh, met. Uh, and then, of course, uh, in a way, felt fortunate that I was able, through my subsequent career to return to some of their work. I mean, the most exciting thing about these people, and I mentioned Arendt or Krakow or Siegfried Krakow, another figure who I never actually met, members of the Frankfurt School and others, is that their work has continued to be uh, interesting to subsequent generations. So this is not simply historical, it also has current impact. And then I also uh, lived through what might be seen as the relative eclipse of their influence during the 1980s and 90s when they had passed from the scene most of them had died by, say, 1990, uh, when French thinkers, uh, mostly associated with post-structuralism, became uh, more important. Uh, figures uh, like Michel Foucault or Jacques Derrida or uh, Jacques Lacan, some of whom came to Berkeley. Foucault was here for a while. Others came to California, Jean-Francois Lyotard and Jacques Derrida were at Irvine for many years. And they became, in a way, the European touchstones of a certain kind of intellectual depth. Uh, and uh, the real issue is how to figure out the uh, complicated relationship between some of these earlier figures uh, and these French thinkers. And we're still, in a way, sorting all of that out. So there are some like um, you know, Martin Heidegger, for example, or Adorno or Walter Benjamin, who are figures in both discourses, broadly speaking, sometimes demonized, sometimes celebrated. Uh, and there are cross-fertilizations uh, that existed. I wrote a piece fairly recently on the debate over lying in politics that occurred, well, debate may be too strong, but at least the uh, conversation that occurs when Jacques Derrida writes a piece on Hannah Arendt on lying in politics. So they themselves, the French, went back and reflected on the Germans. So it's a very uh, interesting soup, we might say, in which the ingredients include this generation of Germans, and then later French thinkers, there are also Italian thinkers like Giorgio Agamben, who, are, who would be part of that, Gianni Vattimo and others. So it's a European-wide phenomenon. Uh, the one thing that has also been added since then, and I was quite interested early, one of the questions you put to Tom concerned, uh, Tom Lecoeur, uh, the global impact. Uh, in a way, it was still, although a deprovincializing experience, still what I might call uh, NATO, uh, Western European oriented. That is to say, these were people from Europe, came to the United States, had very, very little connection with Asia or what we would perhaps call the global south, used to be called the third world. There were some emigres, uh, people from Eberhardt uh, and Carl August Wittfogel, for example, who worked on China, but by and large they were Eurocentric and had very little interest in these parts of the world. I remember talking to Herbert Marcuse once about whether or not he'd ever been to uh, Cuba. He was, you know, in some ways close to the Castro Revolution. And he said, no, he didn't speak Spanish. He was not interested in going. And I think this was true of, of many of them. They were really, in some ways, uh, confined to an Atlantic, um, you know, let's say, a sphere of cultural influence. Uh, what they helped to do was to create Berkeley as part of an Atlantic Rim intellectual culture. But we are now, of course, very much part of a global and Pacific Rim oriented culture. And we've benefited enormously from contacts with uh, Asia and with the global South. 
And uh, the German emigres played less of a role in opening that, uh, those vistas, we might say, up to us, uh, opening them up to us than maybe some French intellectuals did later because they were uh, sometimes more interested in post-colonial thought and so forth. So uh, it's a staggered and checkered and overlapping uh, story, which still remains to be uh, told because it's still an ongoing story. And many of these figures, uh, I mentioned names like Arendt or Benjamin uh, or Adorno, uh, are still talismanic figures in the current intellectual uh, world that we inhabit now well into the 21st century. How does it make you feel that we unleashed a group of a cohort of uh, uh, undergraduates into the university archives to dig out some primary sources about this segment of the story? Well, it's a privilege to be able to pass this on because, you know, as I said in the um, the '90s, most of these people had left the scene, and the people who were real and uh, you know flesh and blood figures. Uh, some of them with feet of clay, not all of them heroic, but nonetheless real people, became only names, abstractions. They became basically, uh, you know, a, a kind of historically um, meaningful, but nonetheless no longer present reality. So it's uh, a genuine thrill to be able to involve students in resurrecting that dimension of their work. And luckily we have uh, images, we have interviews, we have uh, recordings of them, so they can uh, be retrieved uh, on that level as well. And I think students um, have still a great deal to learn from them. I mean, it's not as if this is completely, uh, you know, a, uh, an historically antiquarian story. So to be part of that succession uh, of uh, interests um, is one of the things that makes this kind of work uh, very exciting. I mean, uh, just to tell you, you know, how, how much it still is, is going on around the world, I'm going next summer to the 100th anniversary of the founding of the University of Frankfurt to give a talk on Max Horkheimer uh, and his role, uh, Horkheimer, the head of the Institute of Social Research. And then in October, I go to Brandeis to talk on the 50th anniversary uh, of uh, Herbert Marcuse's One Dimensional Man. A couple of months ago, I went to Harvard to give a paper on Adorno and uh, his work on musicology. So these are figures who still um, are part of the fabric of intellectual life today. And it's absolutely fabulous to see young people who have no direct connection with them, being as intrigued by them, inspired by them, and also as critical of them as they need to be, because these are not gods, they're people who had, you know, things to tell us, but also who were prisoners of their own moment and who uh, will, in a sense, uh, always be, um, uh, you know, let's say, available for subsequent evaluation as well as uh, veneration. So one doesn't ever want to instill in students a sense of uh, simple awe uh, and, uh, you know, a kind of uh, slavish reverence wants to have uh, students feel ultimately able to engage in a kind of uh, critical dialogue with them and to learn from them, but also to feel that they can uh, perhaps uh, be critical of them as well.